Well, Boker Tov, Shabbat Shalom. I want to welcome everyone to another uplifting, stirring, and ever so eventful service here at Congregation Brit Chadashah. This is a marvelous day of Shabbat, and I want to begin by just saying, Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, Shehechianu V'Kiyamanu V'Higianu Lazman Hazeh. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has kept us alive to enjoy this season. And I open up with the Shehechianu prayer for two very important reasons. First of all, May 14th, on this day in 1948, from Tel Aviv, Israeli Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion issued forth the Declaration of Independence for the State of Israel, this amazing marker, this prophetic marker in time. And of course, this led to the first Israeli-Arab War, but whenever anything good comes to Israel, the enemy is not going to stand idle, but this is a great day. And another great feature about this morning is that our Torah portion includes this dynamic statement, until the morrow of the seventh Shabbat, you are to count 50 days and then present a new grain offering to Adonai. You are to bring out of your houses two loaves of bread for a wave offering made of two-tenths of an ephah of fine flour. Today is day 28 of the counting of the Omer, leading us up to day 50, which is Shavuot. This is the 28th day marking the resurrection of our Messiah. A grand event that because he rose from the dead, proving that he is both divine and, and human, we are the first, he is the first fruits, and we who will follow after are also going to one day experience resurrection life. This is a great day of celebration, and I'm so thankful that you have joined us here at Congregation Brit Hadashah. We are Buffalo's only and therefore finest Messianic synagogue. We are comprised of Jewish and non-Jewish people who've come to believe that Yeshua, Jesus, is the Messiah of our people. He is the Messiah of, our, of, of all of the nations, and he is the king of all kings. And it is to the effect of honoring him in all that we will do that we gather together on the wonders of this Shabbat. May we please stand as we open up our time and dedicate it and sanctify it to the Lord our God. Lord, you bestowed amazing favor to us. You have given to us treasures from heaven. You have enabled us to see things that we would not have seen if not for the granting of your Ruach HaKodesh alive and well within the hearts of those who love you. May our hearts just be bursting with joy this day as we honor you, as we worship you. We welcome Shabbat. We welcome the presence of the living God, the presence of Messiah in our midst. Be glorified in our midst, we pray. In the name of our Messiah King, Amen and Amen. When we remain standing for the Matovu prayer, how goodly are your tents, O Jacob, your dwelling places, O Israel. As for me, through your great kindness, I will enter your house and bow down towards the sanctuary of your holiness in awe of you. O Lord, I love the shelter of your house and the place of the residence of your glory. I will prostrate myself and bow. I will kneel before the Lord my Maker. May my prayer to you, Hashem, be offered at a time that is favorable. O oh God, in the abundance of your kindness, Answer us with the truth of your salvation.
Shabbat Shalom Umevarach. Last week we celebrated Yom Ha Am Yom Ha Atzmaut. It was Independence Day in Israel. The modern state of Israel was established on the fifth day of the Hebrew month of the R, which was May 14th in 1948. And today is May 14th as well. It was a historic day following at the heels of the Holocaust. It was a remarkable time in the lives of people who withstood deprivation, persecution, and murder throughout their history in the hands of many of the lands on this earth. That day filled the longing of a people to have their own Jewish home, having been outcast from their land for more than two millennia. More than anything, it marks God's faithfulness in restoring his people to the homeland of promise, first gifted 3,800 years ago. Across Israel, events and celebrations had taken place, both on a national and local scale, in almost every city and town. Yearly, a major celebration takes place at Mount Herzl, Israel's national ceremonial location in Jerusalem. It also marks the end of Yom Chazikaron, the day of remembrance, commemorating the soldiers and people who lost their lives during the struggle to defend Israel's homeland. There were fireworks and parties. At these parties, there were tears shed, especially among Holocaust survivors who remembered the loss of loved ones, and there were tears of joy as well. Their life was reborn in having children and, and grandchildren in the land of freedom. After all, this is their party too, and they can cry if they want to. They can cry if they want to. Jews have enjoyed freedom at different times of their existence, beginning with the first Passover. It is God who heard the cry of his people and delivered them from a cruel bondage. The Hebrews went on to live in the land of promise under a theocracy, a God-ruled nation. Yet after having tasted of freedom, they soon failed to appreciate Adonai, turning away from him, being exiled in return. So freedom from physical bondage eventually led to a spiritual indifference and then to rejection of God. How does this happen? How did some leave their first love for the Holy One? Perhaps for them, as well as for us, it may feel that dependence on God takes away from our own self-sufficiency. And there may be other reasons that we turn away from Him. Perhaps we resent Adonai for the petitions that are not answered to our liking. And there may be relationship issues in our lives that we determine to control on our own without God. And as well, there are things in this world that draw us to desire it above our God. And these desires become our idols whether we think of it in this way or not. And so we become trapped in Satan's wiles. And while we seek to control things in our lives, it controls us. As is written on the screen, For freedom, Messiah set us free. So stand firm and do not be burdened by a yoke of slavery again. And, and brothers and sisters, you are called to freedom. Only do not let your freedom become an opportunity for the flesh but through love serve one another. And so to follow an independent path apart from Abba God is what Satan offered 2,000 years ago and our Messiah rejected. And for us to seek self apart from God is to accept Lucifer's invitation. There really is no neutral path in life. 
So as we celebrate this faithful day of Israel's independence, we also celebrate the greater independence that will arise from our Messiah's return to the land. As it is he who promised to save Israel and return as our reigning king. For the God who would judge us from on high decided to descend on this earth. And it is he who showed us how to be totally reliant on Abba God, even unto death. And so we remember Yeshua who died on Mount Moriah in another Yom Chazikalon, the day our Messiah gave his life in defending us from Satan's grasp. For he truly came not to judge us, but to relieve us from eternal judgment. And it is his reliance on the Father that has brought us freedom. May he always fully reign in our lives as we revive our first love. And so we hearken back to that day when we first looked upon God who became present in our lives. For on that day we were in awe that there was a creator who first looked upon us with a love and a care that we never thought was possible. For us on judgment day in heaven, there will be enough tears for the joy for us being there. And there will also be enough tears for the heartache given the times that we did not fully depend on him. After all, it is our party, and we can cry if we want to. We can cry if we want to, at least until he wipes our tears away. We wish him. moment, I felt like a jack-in-the-box. <laughs> he who abides forever, exalted and holy is his name. And it is written, sing joyfully, you righteous, to the Lord. It is befitting for the upright to praise him. By the mouth of the upright you shall be lauded. By the words of the righteous, <clears throat> you shall be blessed. By the tongue of the pious, you shall be exalted. And in the midst of the holy, you shall be sanctified. Amazing words that come to us from Isaiah 57. <speaking in Hebrew> Borahu et Adonai Hamavorach Baruch Adonai Hamvorach Leolam Vaed. Bless the Lord, the Blessed One. Blessed be the Lord, the Blessed One, for all eternity. And reading responsibly from Exodus chapter 28 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Above all, my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai
Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kevod Malachuto Le'olam Va'ed Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be the name of his glorious kingdom for all eternity. V'yahavta et Adonai Elohecha, b'chol levacha, u'v'chol nafshecha, u'v'chol meodecha, v'chayu hadvarim ha'eler, asher anochi mitzavcha hayom al levavecha, v'shinan tam levonecha, v'dibarte bam, v'shiftecha b'veitecha, u'v'lechtecha v'aderech, u'v'shachbecha u'v'kumecha, Uksharktam leot al yodecha, vehayu letotafot bein enecha, uchatavtam al mezuzot, beitecha uvish arecha. And you shall hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be the name of his glorious majesty forever and ever. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your means. And these words which I command you today shall be upon your heart. Teach them diligently to your children, and talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk on the road, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Bind them for a sign upon your hand, and for frontlets between your eyes. Write them upon the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. Please join me in the prayer for Israel. And I'm going to draw from Isaiah 51. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness and who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were cut, and to the quarry from which you were hewn. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who gave you birth. When I called him, he was only one man, and I blessed him and made him many. That verse fascinates me, uh, what God needs or doesn't need from us. And it also occurs to me that we have actually seen more of this promise with our physical eyes than Abraham did. Abraham accepted it. And Yeshua said he saw, saw this and rejoiced to see this day. But the fact that God didn't need an army of people, that he didn't need borders already established or a land already established, he drew from one man and made them many. Lord, I just thank you that um, you are totally in control, Lord God, that you are not depending on us or anyone within or outside of Israel to do this, Lord God, but you are including them, Lord. So I pray, Father as you reset their borders, Lord God, and as you deal with the nations around them, Lord, in this awful world and all the awful things that are going on, Lord God, either consciously or subconsciously point to your, your children, to your people, Lord. But you started this with just one man, Lord God. You could have done it with no man. But Lord, this is what your will was, and it is proof of you, Lord. The fact that what we see today, what we have seen happen today, is proof that your promises are true and that this is going to happen and there will be fulfillment, Lord God. So we just pray for your people, Lord, to look back to Abraham, to look what, how this started and to look to where they are and to see your hand in it, Lord God, to turn to you, Lord God, to turn to no other king or no other world leader or no other ideology or anything else. But what you have said from the beginning has come to pass, and it is proof, and that they will look to you, and that they will come to you and hear the words you long to hear from your beloved. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Lord, you stand at the door and knock like the lover in song of songs, going to the door of his beloved and reaching through the lattice. We pray, Lord God, that they would run to that door and their hearts would melt as they make eye contact with you. Pour out on them, Lord God. Draw them close to you. Bring healing into this nation. Bring your protection over them, Lord God. Change the hearts of people.
people within and outside her borders. Change the hearts of the nations, Lord God. The enemy is very loud in this world against your people. But Lord, your whisper is greater than the enemy's voice. Let your people hear it and gravitate and run toward it. In Yeshua's name, amen. It is so great to be in this place. You know, I don't know about you, but you know, we, you know, in this, in this coming September, October, we are going to be marking 10 years in this synagogue. At the High Holy Days, 10 years. And I, want, and I want to tell you, even though I've been married 45 years, and we've been here 10 years, every day in this place is like a, a honeymoon. And every, every day is like a, a renewal of a honeymoon. But we are so grateful for this marvelous, marvelous synagogue that God has miraculously granted to us. And, you know, this synagogue, like everything that transpires, it all hinges on the faithfulness of everybody. And uh, today is Shalachim Shabbat. It's the day where we designate offerings that are designated for outreach rather than going into our general fund. And now, mind you, we have always purposed as a board of this congregation to give well beyond a minimal tithe. Look, you know, tithe is bare minimum. Did you know that? <laughs> In the New Covenant, it's bare minimum. It's bare minimum. But we always strive to give about 15% and even more. And, you know, I, I look back at all of the discussions, and, you know, I'm just thankful to many, you know, Alan and Hans, board members, past, present. You know, we... Uh, this has always been our goal when we get together that we be a congregation of givers. And individuals who want to give to the congregation, you can utilize the pushka in the rear of our sanctuary. You could even go online to our website and make a, and, and make a, a, a gift by utilizing PayPal. Uh, but anyway, you know, this is the season of the counting of the Omer. This is day 28, and as the scripture reminds us that the children of Israel each day would bring forth an Omer offering to the Lord. And we have been doing this for decades, where we ask everybody to lay aside their own Omer offering. And then on Shavuot, we bring all of our collective Omer offerings, and these also go out as outrage to be a blessing to the many uh, people and, and ministries that this congregation gives to on a monthly basis. That said, I believe my wife has some announcements to bring to your attention. Well, Shabbat Shalom. I was also going to mention we've been here for 10 years. And the reason I was going to mention it is because in all of that time, we have um, had a very dedicated crew of volunteers who have come in weekly to clean it. It is amazing to me that we have never had to hire outside help to clean this facility. And I just want to mention them by name. Mary Biondo comes every week to vacuum. David Caputo comes every week. Well, you got to hold off because I'll never get through it. David Caputo comes every week to empty the garbages and to sweep up and mop the social hall uh, floor, which in the winter you can imagine the job that is. Um, Eric Yulatovsky and Deborah Son Georgi come and clean our bathrooms every week. Maureen Bomber comes every week and does the classrooms and some of the hallways. Richard Sturm comes every week and feeds, waters all our plants and does some hallways. Um, and we also have Charlie Scherfeld who comes and does some extra things in the sanctuary. So, um, yeah, Mary vacuums this entire sanctuary every week, or at least the parts that you get dirty. So, so um, and she loves it. She loves coming and doing that. And in 10 years, we have never had to hire outside help to come and clean this huge facility. So let's give us all... And there's one area I didn't mention, um, the kitchen. So uh, 
I guess that's me. Every week I come and I mop the floors a little and vacuum a little and clean off the counters, and I need someone to fill in for me for June and July of this year. So if you can do that, please let me know. Um, it's really a small little job. shouldn't take you more than 45 minutes at that. Um, so uh, if you can do that. And also, uh, every year I ask for help in doing some of the weeding here. So we have, um, I have it divided it up into four areas. It shouldn't take you more than a half an hour every two weeks to come in and just do some of the weeding. So there's um, the front of the building here, which doesn't require you to get inside, and then the courtyard. Um, there's two areas there. If you can come and help with the weeding, um, that, that would be great. So um, that's that. So please see me if you can help me with that, or you can contact me online. And uh, I just want to mention Messiah Conference July 2nd through the 9th. This year, if you have not um, had a chance to ever experience that, that's something that you want to, to do if you can make that happen. There are forms to that effect or um, brochures to that effect on our info table as you exit the, the synagogue. And if you've ever had a chance to go, you know that you always want to go back. So it's an amazing time with speakers from all over the world uh, come in, uh, music groups come from around the world, and um, teachings go on uh, all morning, sometimes all afternoon, depending on what's available. And, and of course, evening time, we all get together for a time of worship, and uh, as well as uh, messages that come forth and different music groups that minister to, to everyone. So um, you should make that a part of your uh, summer if you can. So God bless you all, and I am done. Okay, thank you, Margaret. You know, and uh, when it comes to our grounds, you know, she mentioned Charlie, and Charlie has the, the grounds looking really well, but also Hans, uh, who oversees so much of that. You may not have noticed, but we're missing one less tree that was on our property. There was an old, sickly oak tree at this quadrant of our property that had to come down regretfully. It couldn't be saved. It came down, but Hans oversees all of that. If you need wood chips for mulch, help yourself. <laughs> okay. You know, I want to, uh, you know, begin by reading to you uh, a small part of a message that I gave 14 years ago. And I came upon this while looking for something else. But I just want, want you to hear what I wrote and said 14 years ago. I have a strong sense that we as a nation are at a point of no return. The threshold of our sin has been reached. The time of withholding judgment is past. And all we could do at this hour is to slow the speed of our fall. Without prayer and the active proclamation of the power of God, we are in a free fall. With them, we alight down slowly with a parachute. In each instance, we're still going down. It's never been my style to be apocalyptic or to use sensationalism. I have never wanted to sound like some chicken little or to be one who sees the devil in everything. The thoughts I offer are measured, not reactionary, and I will present them with the given precedence of Scripture. It pains me to no end to say these things because I love this country and I hate seeing what it is fast becoming. For my parents, this country was a haven a place of opportunity, a place whereby hard work was rewarded. It wasn't like the lives they left behind them in Ukraine or Hungary, where communism, socialism, Nazism, totalitarianism, and anti-Semitism made it difficult for a Jew to get ahead. Moreover, under those systems, nobody was able to make a living unless perhaps you work for the state. Those not employed by the state became wards of the state. 
Government became their God, and they looked to government to solve. They looked to government to become their God, and they looked to the government to solve everything. Individual freedom and incentive to get ahead was crushed. Our founding fathers came to these shores for religious freedom. The framers of our Constitution endeavored to have just laws that would not infringe on religious liberty. The danger now before us rests in an increasingly powerful government that is issuing forth edicts supportive of a new morality, not the morality of our framers. So why was this important you know, for me to read? I'm looking at today's Torah portion, Parsha Amor, and what I am seeing is God's calling upon the Kohanim calling upon the, the, the priesthood to be a model, an example to all of Israel, to be to him as a priesthood. That this priesthood would answer to a more, more higher calling, a more higher authority. That the priesthood could not do the, the, the same things that the average Israelite could do. He was restrictive as to who he could marry, the clothes that he would wear, his observance of days, his, the various uh, washings that he under, had to undergo. He had to answer to a higher standard. And I consider that all of us who have placed our trust in the Lord, we become, as a Kohanim, as a, a, a royal priesthood, setting the bar higher than the rest of society. And when I say setting the bar higher, I'm referring to our adherence to the writings, the inspired writings of the Scripture. That in a day where there just seems to be so much injustice that we can take the biblical teachings and transform things one individual at a time. And I've titled my, my message, An Elitist Class. Because this is what the Kohanim today need to be, an elitist class. And uh, I know I'm forgetting there's something I wanted to mention. Yeah, the, there will be Torah talk. I need to just give high, high praise to Elder Mike. This is a man who's ready in season and out. I had asked him yesterday afternoon and with so short a notice, he was quick to say, I can do it, I can cover it. And so we will have Torah talk thanks to the marvelous resiliency and quick on his feet, Elder Mike Merlo. Baruch Hashem. All right, well, let us stand for the blessings over our Torah reading this morning. Now, when I sang earlier, you know, my throat was kind of raspy, and I'm, and I'm reminded that my daughter's coming into town in a couple of weeks, and we got out an old bicycle, and it creaked as it moved. You know, I haven't sang all week, and so my vocal cords were creaking as I tried to utilize them. So the thing is, I'm going to have to menace Margaret during the week by doing more singing around the house, just to get warmed up. Baruch et Adonai Hamavorach. Baruch Adonai Hamavorach Leolam Vaed. Baruch Ato Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam. Asher Bachar Banu Miko Haomim. Vet Natan Lanu et Torato. Baruch Ato Adonai. No Taina Torah. Amen. From Leviticus 21 6. They are to be holy to their God and not profane the name of their God. For they present the offerings of Adonai made by fire, the bread of their God. Therefore, they are to be holy. They are not to marry women who are defiled as prostitutes or profane. 
neither should they marry women divorced from their husbands. For a Kohen is holy to his God. Therefore, you are to sanctify him because he offers the bread of your God. He should be holy to you, for I, Adonai, who sanctifies you, am holy. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'olam, asher natan lanu Torah emet, v'chaye olam nata betucheinu, Baruch atah Adonai, no teina Torah. Amen. Please be seated. Oh, the Kohanim. Four times it is mentioned in this chapter, the, you know, the, the verse or related verses, they bring to you the bread of God. They are the ones who are going to make God's words up front, up close, and personal. They bring to you nourishment through the Spirit because of the things that are written within the Scripture, the bread of God. In the Talmud and Sanhedrin 102b, there is an insightful conversation between Rabbi Ashi and King Manasseh. Now, of course, Rabbi Ashi lived in the 4th century of the Common Era, and Manasseh lived at around 600 before the Common Era. And although they lived about a thousand years apart, it still makes for a good story. King Manasseh, according to 2 Kings 21, was a wicked, idolatrous king, one who had offered his own son on the altar of Moloch. And as the story goes, Rabbi Ashi made fun of King Manasseh during a public lecture. That night, the king appeared to him in a dream and asked him a difficult question of Jewish law. Rav Ashi did not know the answer, whereupon Manasseh told him, Rav Ashi asked him, Since you are so wise, why did you worship idols? Manasseh replied, Had you been living in my time, you would have picked up the skirt of your garment and run after me. Now I mention these very same things you know, a, a few short weeks ago, because we're always trying to categorize people and judge them for the decisions that they made back in their day as if they have the same kind of understanding of the things that we have today. And you have the very same principle in place here with this Talmudic illustration. The ten northern tribes of Israel were devoid of a righteous king. All of them were wicked. It was like a who could be the biggest and the baddest of all. Each one exceeded the evils of the other. The southern kingdom of Judah had some good, wise, and God-fearing kings. What is the difference between the good kings and the bad kings? The bad kings established the high places of idolatry, whereas the good kings tore them all down. Without question... Idolatry presents a powerful attraction. It is so much easier to conform to the flow of society than to stand alone for the principles of God. Living more than a millennium after Manasseh, it was difficult for Rav Ashi to imagine any intelligent person being attracted to idolatry. He couldn't imagine any intelligent person killing their young. And so here we are today, and we wonder about the same things as Rav Ashi. Yet here we are, where we have legalized all forms of abortion, our own way of sacrificing to Moloch, and have even created a market for aborted fetuses. It's big business, it's industry, and for this, the secular society celebrates. And before I go any further, 
you know, I was really touched by an article published by Dr. Michael Brown. How many receive his newsletters? But I just want to read, you know, a, a small portion of what he had to say, because it's very sobering. You know, I would say that almost all of us here at the congregation, we are pro-life. And in our efforts to be supportive of the pro-life movement, there are times that we forget things that we shouldn't forget. And this article helped, help, helps us remind us. It says, in the midst of the raging national debate about abortion, as followers of Jesus, we must never forget that we are not just dealing with an issue, and we are not just dealing with the life of the baby in the womb. We are dealing with other people, with women who have had abortions in the past, and with men who participated in abortions in the past, and for whom the current debate brings up old wounds. He says, these people are in our congregations, listening to our podcasts. We must always keep them in mind when we talk about the evils of abortion, even though they know that they are forgiven by the Lord. Most of them have grown up with Roe, and abortion is a way of life. And they wonder, will they be forced to bring a baby into the world, even if the pregnancy was entirely unintended, and having a child now would devastate their lives? Continues, but I am appeal appealing to you as a follower of Jesus to remember that these women or men are important in God's sight as well. And rather than repel them, we must find ways to reach them. Did not God himself reach out to us when we had no interest in him at all? Many of these people are women who have had abortions, who identify as pro-choice, yet they too are hurting. And some of their anger is masking the pain that they carry. So you get the gist of it. Let's remember to talk about forgiveness and redemption when we engage in public discussion about abortion. You know, there are so many hurting, hurting individuals. And as much as we are pro-life, we also need to be understanding listening, sympathetic, and trying to help people along their way. But, you know, you know here we are. This is the, the, the public discourse. Most everything that the Torah forbids reflects the ways of the nations. Every detestable practice enumerated in Torah reflects the very practices of daily life among the nations. Israel was called to be a distinct and separate from the nations. God had set Israel apart by showing them a better way through the giving of His law. They were set apart by God as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And God had told them straight up in Leviticus 18, You shall not do what is done in the land of Egypt where you lived nor are you to do what is done in the land of Canaan, where I am bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. The practices of Egypt and Canaan, the ones enumerated in Torah, all fall under the category of idolatry. Idolatry is so much more than just bowing to a graven image. It is perpetuating the evils that historically have brought God's judgment. Idolatry incorporates the worship of self. It's discarding what God says that we may do what is pleasing in our own sight. Amidst all of the choices of the peoples and nations, a real Kohen, a real priest, is to stand in the gap and to uphold God's commandments. This isn't a favorable spot from a worldly vantage, but from God's, nothing could be more fulfilling or bring him more joy when his kohanim stand against the idolatrous flow of society at large. 
The Kohen was to be an elitist class of a believer, one not given to the whims, whims of secular abominations. And Parasha Amor gives special instructions to the priesthood. The priests of Israel were not to conduct themselves as the pagan priest of the surrounding nations. The priests of Israel were not to go anywhere near a dead body, unlike the pagans who had rituals around the dead. The priests of Israel were not to shave themselves bald or make any cuts in their flesh, for this is what the pagans did. Just review at your own leisure the showdown on Mount Carmel between the priests of Baal and Elijah, and you'll see exactly what's taking place. See, people are copycats. Successful marketing campaigns just feed off of our desire to be like someone else or do something that someone else has done. I'm not a social media guy. I have never once had Facebook. I've never been a part of it. But I know from what I see, from my kids and my grandkids, it's the buzz. Everybody's trying to emulate somebody else. Or somebody's going to try to do something silly just to see how many hits that they can get on YouTube. Everybody's wanting to be a copycat. Everybody's wanting they have their little moment of glory. The priests of Israel were not to emulate the practices of the nations. They were not to be sucked in by the pomp and the ceremony. The priests of Israel formed an elitist class. Israel was an elite people, and within Israel, they were to be an elitist class of Kohanim who understood both their chosenness and their calling. You know, in the rear of the sanctuary, I see Reverend Lisa Taylor. Lisa, it is always a joy to have you here. And I understand you just received your ordination. <laughs> she has been serving for so many years, but she's still waiting for the final... the, 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 the final threshold of, of, of being ordained. But for many years, you know, Reverend Lisa and many others, you know, they have been battling their denomination over an encroaching liberalism that has been set, that is dividing the Methodist church. I applaud you, and I applaud all of our friends of your de denomination who have not bowed the knee to Baal. But there is a chosenness, there is a, a calling. And the purpose of Leviticus 21 and 22 was to instruct the priest as to the manner of living and serving in a way that it would inspire people to learn the meaning of holiness. These would be the same principles that Rabbi Shaul would draw from in laying out the qualifications required from an individual who holds a position of spiritual leadership. The priest of Israel was not to take a questionable woman for a wife. The priest was not to marry a divorcee. A priest's choice of a mate was to reflect wholeness in the innocence of our first parents, Adam and Eve. They were to set the national standard for holiness. God had set high standards for the priesthood. And whereas our text lays out the requirements of the Kohen, God sees all Israel as a kingdom of priests and a people separate and unlike the nations. Exodus 19, 5 and 6. Now then, if you listen closely to my voice and keep my covenant, then you will be my own treasure from among all people. For all the earth is mine. So as for you, you will be to me a kingdom of Kohanim and a holy nation. These are the words which you are to speak to B'nai Israel. Having said that, do you believe in the priesthood of the believer? Do you believe that everyone who names the name of Yeshua, 
becomes an integral part of a kingdom of priests. In our day, many from the nations have been grafted into Israel by virtue of receiving this high call. And now they are a part of a royal priesthood. With calling comes responsibility. Shimon Kepha, writing primarily to Jewish believers, as well as to others, says this to non-Jewish believers. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You were shown no mercy, but now you have been shown mercy. Loved ones, I urge you, as strangers and sojourners, keep away from the fleshly cravings that war against the soul. Keep your conduct honorable among the Gentiles. Then while they speak against you as evildoers, they may, from noticing your good deeds, glorify God in the day of visitation. See, the, the, the title of the parsha says it all, Amor, speak. God telling Moses to speak to the Kohanim, to speak to all Israel, to speak to every nation, these holiness codes. As a priesthood, we are to live by these codes and speak of them. And if we don't speak in favor of God's words, folks, who will? See, if the priesthood is silent, then only the secularist voices are going to be heard. And if they are the only ones that are going to be heard, we open ourselves up to a new morality, a morality that does not reflect the holiness codes. Moral conviction is fast fading and obedience to God becoming rather passe. Thus, as a result of compromise, it sets in and people draw further from God, which is why we now call evil good and good evil. You know, just look at the absolute rage and anger that is out in the secular society. There is more compassion today, for example, for a robin's eggs, or polar bears, or the life of a tree, than the life of a human. And as with ancient Israel, no attention is being paid to biblical morality. We have been so seduced to doing evil and feeling good about it. And we collectively fail to see that when sin fascinates, it also has a way to assassinate. An elitist class needs to emerge because we do have a great message, one that needs to be lived, a message that needs to be heard, and the responsibility falls to us as a kingdom of priests. Can we truly say in our hearts, I am not ashamed of the good news? Can we say it without any reservation? I am am not ashamed of the good news, because if we are not ashamed, then our voice needs to be heard. See, I'm not a pessimistic person, but I see some really ominous days ahead simply because we have lost our collective conscience, our collective voice, and therefore we, have, we are losing the moral high ground. We can say to ourselves, I can't say what I believe because it's political, and I can't be political. Or, it's not for me to judge, it's in God's hands. Now having... A priesthood obligates us to following God. You know, I just pray that our fear of God would be greater than our fear of men. We have a vibrant message, 
a redemptive message, one of forgiveness, one of hope. The Bible gives us a long list of people and nations who exhausted God's mercy by never coming to a place of repentance. And for their rebellion, they were banished and they were expelled. For her sins, even Israel was twice banished from her land. We have reached the threshold of national sin, and God has no other recourse than to bring judgment. Maybe I'm so influenced by Jonathan Kahn's movie of Thursday night, but it was very impacting. You know, as I see it, it's too cliche to say, God bless America. Rather, we should be saying, may America bless God. Just turn the whole thing around. May America bless God. From his book on Jewish wisdom, Rabbi Joseph Telushkin writes, From Judaism's perspective, idolatry occurs when one holds any value higher than God and morality. A person who says, my country, right or wrong, and on this basis acts unjustly, is an idolater. By regarding his country's demand to do wrong as more binding than God's demand to do right, such an individual makes it clear that he or she regards country as higher than God. See, this kind of thinking has always led to trouble. And apart from God, there is no morality. The Nazis, the Soviets, the Marxists were all aggressively atheist. And in those states, it became a crime to advocate a belief in God. It was outlawed. It was punishable. Why do we have to have court cases over sports coaches praying with their team? Why should it even get to court? And where is the real lack of tolerance? See, one paid homage to the state in those states. And if you didn't, you were imprisoned as a dissident. This is what Mordecai and Daniel and the prophets, the Maccabees, and Rabbi Akiva were all up against. And let me say here as well that Nero fed thousands of Messianic Jews to the lions for not worshiping the emperor. And listen, I want you to listen to what Rabbi Burrell Wine writes in an online article on Parasha Amor. And as you hear this, consider the many attempts by the American left to completely overhaul this country and transform it into a socialistic society. But Rabbi Wine writes, The world has just left its most horrific century, one that has seen almost 150 million human beings done to death by war, governmental policies, and brutal social engineering schemes. One of those social engineering schemes practiced in Russia and China and in other Marxist-run societies as well was to make everyone equal in those societies. Of course, some people were more equal than others, but basically the idea was to rid the society of leaders, intellects, religious models, and others who were bourgeois or elitist. A drab facelessness covered the landscape of those countries, and a tyranny almost unequaled in human annals devoured its equal citizens. And by making everyone equal, these tyrannies attempted to effectively silence any dissident thoughts or politically incorrect behavior. This this is sobering. In closing, what we need so desperately is for an elitist class to emerge, for a kingdom of Kohanim to find their voice, to find their courage, to bring a message of forgiveness, redemption, 
to bring a message of hope. People everywhere are struggling to find answers for the, the ills that are so grievous in our society. And those answers come from the very source that we have dedicated ourselves to follow. The words of God following in the footsteps of Moses, the prophets, the writers of the Bri Chadashah. But we need to emerge to take back ground that have been surrendered. We were especially called to meet the challenges before us. And as demonic forces seek to reclaim the glory days of Babel and bring us into a one world government, we are here in the authority of King Messiah. Understand we walk in the authority of King Messiah. We are priests of the highest God. And in our call to holiness, we stand in opposition and pray against powers and principalities of the air that oppose God's purposes. And priests, they bring the bread of God. They bring the bread of life. The words that we could live by. And this isn't just a national thing. It's personal it's very personal because we have to decide who it is that we are going to serve. Sitting on the fence is lukewarmness. Silence is being fearful. Not being kohanim at this hour could maybe be interpreted as a betrayal of trust. And lastly, from Ta'anit to A, is this Talmudic statement, the statement offered during a time of pestilence. Rav Yehuda's ruling tells us not to react with pride in our hearts. Even though we know that pigs are unclean and we do not eat them, the plague may spread to infect kosher animals as well. You know, there is an undercurrent. There is an anti-Messiah spirit that has been unleashed on this earth. And we are not to allow it to infect a kosher heart, a clean heart. We have a hope, a messianic hope. And the day will yet come when Messiah will return and restore order to this world but he utilizes vessels, servants like you and I to bring about change in our respective communities, our state, our national government, and even on a global basis. We are his kohanim, his representatives. And as we follow and we pursue the messianic hope, may we be so taken by a spirit of just teshuva that we could see great things abounding in the near future. It's not enough just to say, yeah, well, you know, I read the end of the book and we win. Look, you know, that's so simplistic that, you know, I want to gag every time somebody says something like that. You know, the, 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 the battle is taken right here, taking place right here, right now. And you are the grand and awesome army that God has conscripted. Amen. Let us walk in all of his ways. And let us look at this call as kohanim to be personal. And ask the Lord to show me things that are unclean, that are beginning to take root. And by our own acts of self-examination and our own acts of self-judgment, let's do house cleaning. We don't have to wait, you know, for, uh, you know, pre-Pesach preparations to do inner house cleaning, but let every day, but every day let, you know, reflect an inner teshuva wanting to be set right before the Holy One, blessed be He. Will we please stand for the ironic benediction.
No. A benediction, you know, denotes the close of our service proper. But because we close our service, it does not put an end to the way that God works. God continues to work. He goes beyond, you know, the ironic benediction. And if God has touched you with something, let us utilize the time that we have as Tom ministers to us in song, that if there is something that touched you, let the Spirit of God do a greater work within you. You are Kohanim. Be strong, be bold, be firm in the calling that God has given to you. Ya er Adonai penevu lecha vichunecha. Ye say Adonai penevu lecha via same lecha shalom. Adonai bless you and keep you. Adonai make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. Adonai turn his face toward you and grant you shalom. May he turn his face toward you and give you shalom. May he turn his face toward you and grant to you another reflection of the love that he just wants to shower you with. Let us walk with him and partake in the many goodnesses that he has shown us today. Amen and amen. Shabbat shalom, shabbat shalom, shabbat 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 shalom. Shabbat 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 Shabbat